Causation is a really important part of tort law because it links the duty that's owed by the defendant on one hand with the damage that's suffered by the claimant on the other. Fortunately, if this comes up in a problem question, there's a relatively simple test that you would need to apply uh, on the basis of the facts which you will already have in front of you. However, there are a few different issues that can crop up and this is what we're going to look at in this lecture. The first thing that we need to say is that there are two different types of causation. There's factual causation that we're going to be looking at in today's lecture and there's also legal causation, otherwise known as remoteness, that we're going to be looking at in a future video. So factual causation, otherwise known as the but-for test, um, is set out there in front of you. If this does come up in a problem question, then all you need to do is set out the test. So would the damage have occurred but for the action or omission of the defendant? State that the legal authority for this is the case of Barnett and Chelsea and Kensington Hospital 1969. And then when you're applying it to the facts of the scenario, remember to say that causation has to be proved on the balance of probabilities. Now there are a number of issues that can arise around causation and the but-for test. One of these is multiple causes, so some of these might be innocent and some of these might be tortious. In McGee and National Coal Board, McGee contracted a lung disease and one of the reasons for this was that he worked around brick dust all day and so this was always going to be a possible consequence from his employment. That's a perfectly innocent cause. But the tortious one that was also involved in this case was that the National Coal Board, his employers, did not provide proper washing facilities. And so how do we balance this potentially innocent cause where there is no liability with this tortious cause where there may be liability for the National Coal Board? Well, in this particular case, Lord Wilberforce said that it is a sound principle that where a person has by breach of a duty of care, created a risk and injury occurs within the area of that risk, the loss should be borne by him unless he shows that it had some other cause. Essentially what Lord Wilberforce is doing here is reversing the burden of proof. So normally the burden of proof would be on the claimant to prove the case and to prove that there is causation between the duty of care and the damage that has occurred. However, Lord Wilberforce is saying here that it's actually up to National Coal Board to prove that there isn't causation or that there is a perfectly innocent reason for McGee contracting the lung disease in this particular case. This reversal of the burden of proof was heavily criticised by Lord Bridge in Wilshire and Essex Area Health Authority 1988. And so we're in a bit of a funny position today. Now, if this does come up in a problem question or an essay question um, in your exams, I think that the approach that you would need to take is to say that generally speaking, the burden of proof is always on the claimant to prove their case, whether that's in terms of causation or the duty of care or the tort overall. However, there may be circumstances where there's multiple causes where it's actually fair um, and reasonable for the burden of proof to be reversed. And so it's up to the defendant to prove that their actions did not actually cause the harm to the claimant. On a similar um, thing with multiple causes, another issue might be multiple defendants. And so I've put the classic prank here of pushing someone over someone's crouched back as an example of where there may be multiple defendants and this can be problematic in terms of establishing causation. And the way to think about this is what would happen here in these circumstances with a strict application of the but-for test. Now we have the claimant here who we, we will say he fell over, he cracked his head on the pavement and he's suing A and B. Now A may say, well, I was just crouched on the pavement and it's not my actions that have actually caused him to crack his head open. Um, it's B who pushed him, and so I'm not responsible. And so similarly, B would say, well, I just pushed him. It was actually A who was crouched on the floor, 
that meant that the claimant fell over backwards and cracked his head on the pavement. And so you can see how this strict application of the but-for test means that, technically speaking, neither A nor B would be responsible. But clearly that's unfair because they're both responsible. So how do we actually deal with this in um, a real-life tort case? Well, Fitzgerald and Lane is a very good example. Here the claimant was crossing a pelican crossing. There was a car coming really fast one way. It hit the claimant. He flew up in the air and he uh, landed um, on the bonnet of a car that was going really fast the other way. And as a result, the claimant suffered really bad back injuries. But we have this similar situation again, where both of the drivers are saying, well, it was the other car that was driving really fast and therefore was responsible for the back injury. It's not for me um, to have to pay up because it's not my driving that has caused it. Clearly, this would be a repugnant set of circumstances and it would be unfair for both drivers to get away with this by simply blaming the other one. And so we again have this situation where the burden of proof can be reversed. Also, we have this uh, principle of liability in solidum, which is a Latin phrase meaning sort of in solidarity or together. And so both of the defendants in this case can be sued together and both are potentially liable for the damage that has occurred to the claimant. And so this is how the courts get around the problem of multiple defendants. Exposure to risk is also another interesting area, although it's mainly of sort of historical importance now. There's a disease called mesothelioma, which can be contracted. It's a lung disease that can be contracted by exposure to asbestos. And one of the problems or the interesting features of the disease is that you can be exposed to asbestos for five minutes and you could contract the disease or you could be exposed to it to 30 for 40 years and never contract the disease at all. It's quite random in the way that it affects people and their exposure to asbestos. And so this creates a problem in causation because you can imagine that there's a number of circumstances where people have worked for two or three employers all around asbestos and all of the employers would turn around and say, well, it's not my asbestos that has caused the lung disease in this particular claimant. So how do they get around this? Well, Fairchild and Glenhaven Funeral Services 2003 was probably the main case on this. And this allowed the claims to succeed in terms of mesothelioma. Barker and Chorus UK Limited 2006 um, sort of developed this a little bit further and said that exposure to the risk itself was the damage. And so this is why the claims would succeed. Now, this is a little bit sort of on dodgy ground at this point because exposure to the risk is not the same as actually suffering the damage. And so this had the potential of upsetting what is normal in tort law. And so Section 3 of the Compensation Act 2006 um, restored the principle of insolidum liability that we talked about last time. And so there was still the possibility for people who had um, contracted mesothelioma to make a case, but it preserved the essential principles of tort law. I think that this is um, probably more out of historical interest now. Um, you could still maybe talk about exposure to risk and make reference to Barker and Chorus, but um, I wouldn't rely on it too heavily. Another interesting area is that of supervening causes. And to look at this in more detail, we can see the example of Baker and Willoughby. Now, Willoughby injured Baker's leg in a car accident, but importantly for this case, a couple of weeks later, Baker was involved in a completely separate incident, an armed robbery at his place of work, and as a result of that, his leg had to be amputated. And so the question for the courts was whether Willoughby should be liable for the injury and the amputation, even though that was part of a completely separate incident a couple of weeks later. And the courts decided the case in the affirmative, saying that Willoughby should be held liable for this. However, from a completely 
non-legal point of view, this just seems completely unfair that Willoughby is being held liable for something that he was not involved with at all. It's basically just bad luck on his part. But as lawyers, we have to sort of look at both sides and we have to remember that if Willoughby hadn't been held liable for that, it's likely that Baker would have hardly received any compensation for the injury at all because of this supervening or overtaking cause. So you have two situations. You have Baker who um, might not have been entitled to full compensation for his injury and Willoughby who's getting shafted by an incident that took place two weeks later. So how did the courts go about resolving this? Well, they started to do so in Jobling and Associated Dairies, where Jobling, who worked as a butcher, slipped on the floor and injured his back. And as part of the medical treatment, it was found that he also had a back condition anyway. And so the question was, again, we have this overtaking cause that would have shortened Jobling's working life anyway. And so should Associated Dairies be liable for that? or simply just liable for the original slip on the floor that caused his back injury. Well, the court in the end decided not to completely overturn Baker and Willoughby, but they basically had a look at the case and said, well, what are the chances that the back condition would have occurred anyway, even without the job? And so we can say there might have been like a 30% chance, for example, that even without the slip on the floor, um, jobling would have still contracted this back injury. But that means that there's a 70% chance that the slip on the floor did contribute towards the back condition, and so they weren't completely separate incidents. And in these types of cases, we can say, well, associated dairies would have to pay 70% of the overall um, value of the liability of this particular case. And this idea of working out numerically how much or to what extent a person is liable for injuries is an interesting question and brings us on to the last topic, the loss of chance, that was defined in the US case of Hicks and United States, 1966. And it basically says, if there was any substantial possibility of survival and the defendant has destroyed it, he is answerable. And so we can apply this quote to jobling in associated dairies and see that if there is the example of, say, 70% chance of survival that has been destroyed by the defendant, then they would be liable to pay 70% of the compensation. However, we do have to remember that this is on the balance of probabilities, and so it does have to be over 50% to begin with in order to establish that chain of causation, and that's coming back to what we talked about right at the start. So one of the exam areas where we often see loss of chance is medical malpractice. And in Greg and Scott, the um, claimant went in for an operation. There was a 25 to 40 percent chance of surviving the operation. And unfortunately, he didn't survive. And so his estate brought a case on his behalf of medical malpractice. Now, in theory, we could apply loss of chance and say that they would have to pay 25 to 40 percent of the compensation that would normally be owed in those circumstances. But because the balance of probabilities requires greater than 50% chance of survival in order to establish that causation in the first place, as per the but for test, we can say that that case was unsuccessful um, because it did not uh, um, get over that threshold. And there we have causation. In most circumstances, it's just going to be a question of applying the but for test. But do remember to look out for those other circumstances, such as multiple defendants or multiple causes that can require you to look at other cases. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. We're going to be looking at remoteness next time, which is another important part of tort law. So make sure to subscribe so that you get a notification when that comes up. Um, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to leave it a like. And if you have any questions about it, then leave those in the comments below and I'll make sure to get back to you. Thanks for watching. Bye.